Merhaba. Günaydın. Haban Bugisaw. This is how far I can go with Turkish language. So let me switch to the English. Uh, thank you very much for kind introduction. It is my great pleasure and the privilege to speak at the very prestigious Steel Conference in Turkey. Uh, before I start my presentation, let me share my acquaintance uh, with your country, the Turkey. Just one, please. Uh, when I was in Turkey for the first time, it was 1987. Our company at that time, NKK Corporation, was building the second Bosporus Bridge. Our company also supplied equipment for steel making and also technology for steel making to companies like uh, Erdemil, Istemil, Kardemil, and Chiklova. So from that perspective, our company has been a part of evolution of the steel industry in Turkey. So for my presentations, presentation, I mean, uh, Steel Orbis gave me two challenging tasks. Challenge number one, to speak after Ms. Basyak Turgut. She is the one of the most prominent and flamboyant speakers in the global steel industry. Her intelligence and also beauty transcend national boundaries. Unfortunately, that is not the case for steel trade, thanks to President Trump. Second challenge is to cover global steel developments within 30 minutes. I have to confess, I am neither economist by trade nor a fortune teller by profession. With those, those disclaimers aside, let me start my presentation. I will talk about economy, steel demand, global overview, the regional developments and trade issues, and briefly about JF Steel Corporation, the company I present. But I have to confess, uh, Ms. Ms. Jilgut mentioned she could change her color. Unfortunately, I don't have that option because like this. So I try a very conventional approach. I hope you won't fall asleep. Global overview economy, uh, these are manufacturing PMIs as of September. As you see, in the month of September, there's PMI is signaling some slowing growth. The IMF revised their forecast for the GDP growth of global and advanced and emerging market and developing economies. So they changed the global forecast from 3.9 to 3.7. But still, we are in the positive range and real economies are continue to be strong. So the, let me take a look at the country and the regions. So global economy maintained a strong momentum through 19, 18, 2019, 18, excuse me. But developed countries, as you see on the slide, expected to slow down in 2019. The emerging economies' outlooks are mixed. Dramatic development in your country and some other countries as well. Emerging Asia, so the growth is more or less flat because of the Chinese growth has been moderating. Uh, this, the same trend can be found in this the chart. Investment growth is still keeping momentum going. The, if you, uh, as you see on the left-hand side, China's contribution to global investment has been diminishing, while other countries are showing strong growth. So we also see uncertainties are on the horizons. A previous uh, speakers mentioned we have seen the rising trade tensions and also normalization of the monetary policies in the US and EU and geopolitical tensions growing out of Brexit, populism, sanctions, so forth. 
When I was preparing this presentation, I added one word, elections. That was last month. So elections in Brazil is now over. The midterm election in the United States was also over. But we need to find what kind of impacts those results are going to bring to us. Let me talk about steel demand. The World Steel Association made announcement of the short range outlook twice a year. This chart is about their short range outlook. They made public last month. So they forecast steel demand for next 18 months. So as you see on the top, the so global steel demand is going to grow by 2.1%, and next year, 1.4%. So similar trends, as you saw, on the economic growth also found in this chart also. Matured economies showing some uh, moderate growth, while other countries showing some more dynamic growth. But one exception is China. China's the growth rate forecast for next year is zero. You know, traditionally, Chinese people come up with very conservative numbers. They like to overperform the numbers they are actually committed to. I personally think the same thing could take place also next year. And post-crisis still demand recovery since 2008. So as you see on the left-hand side, after 2007, 2008, after the financial crisis, each region of the country each, each country and the region have shown growth, with the exception of European Union, CIS, developed Asia. So the chart on the right-hand side is not so clear that Brazil has not come to the level where they used to be. So changing landscape of the steel industry, Dr. Yayan and Ms. Durgut had mentioned, and India is becoming almost going to be number second after China anytime soon. The Turkey is now the eighth largest steel company, a steel country in the world. So that makes the share of the emerging and developing economies uh, to grow. So let me uh, talk about the regional developments. Uh, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about may be, uh, well, the elements or the components my previous speakers have covered. But it's reassuring to know all the speakers talking about the same thing. So we are talking about something right directions. Let me start with China. The China. So China has boasted the double digit growth in some years ago. But the chart on the top right shows the China's GDP and the fixed asset investments are becoming moderated. So that means China's economy is transforming itself from more dependence on uh, investments to the more to private consumption. But real estate investment is breaking up and construction is also in the positive zone. So for China, for China, 6.5% economic growth is something they like to preserve and adhere to. So maybe that's to do with the doubling the economy size for 10 year time, but they have been managed to the maintain the 6.5% this year. Other business segments, the auto um, mobile production and the chart on the top right showing some uh, declines or moderations. And and also the home appliance output showing some moderation also. The recent manufacturing PMI in China is getting close to the 50%. That is a break even point. So some deterioration of the market and financial market sentiment. But overall, steel demand is better than expected. This was the comment made by the Chinese economist two months ago. But the consequences of the trade tensions are the things we need to follow. 
but the China just made announcement to implement infrastructure spending, railroad building earlier than originally planned, and try to relax more monetary policy and so forth. So they will do to meet the end need, just keeping the 6.5 or in the neighborhood of 6.5% economic growth. Let me talk about Japan, the country where I am. Uh, Japan's GDP growth is not so fabulous as the one we saw in China, but still in a positive zone and maintaining uh, moderate growth. The steel sector, uh, please look at the chart on the lower left. Uh, so the orange one is manufacturing steel, 60% uh, of steel use in Japan going to manufacturing, half of 60% going to the automobile industry. That means 30% of the steel we produce in Japan is going to auto, auto-related segments. So leaving construction, 40%. And so the chart on the lower right, so blue bars shows the unemployment rate. So unemployment rate is lower than 3%, so which is 25 year low. So that is causing some shortage for the laborers implementing construction projects and so forth. Uh, next slide about the automobile production, upper right. Uh, so the bars are domestic productions and the red one shows the overseas production. So after the financial crisis, that was followed by steep appreciation of the Japanese yen. Uh, car manufacturers in Japan shifted their production centers to overseas. And after some adjustment of the yen, and they are not coming back. They set up the uh, supply chain system outside. They try to maintain, well, more than they try to maintain, they try to expand their businesses. And residential uh, floor starts are positive signs. But as I said, due to the shortage of labor, and some, we are not, I mean, you know, companies are not able to execute the contracts in a timely manner as they want to do. So overall, the Japanese economy is doing relatively good, good but, but thinking thank about our population demographic. Our population is declining and aging, and the working age population is getting shrink. I had a very lively conversation with Mr. Turbut again before the presentation. I need to work until I die. We believe in the life, lifetime employment, but this is what do not want to have for my professional life. But this, you know, is the where we are in terms of demographics. But your country has very young people and population is growing. So that will that means more still demand to come. So you are strategically very advantageous position. Uh, we envy the, your position very much. About South Korea, South Korea was known for the high economic growth, but now their economic growth is moderating. Still, still use is more or less similar. One prominent feature of the South Korea steel consumption is steel consumption per capita is over 1,000 kgs. I asked, try to use every opportunity to ask, why is that possible? South Korean economy is, is reaching to the maturity, but still one person consumes one ton of steel. Maybe that has something to do with their heavy dependence on shipbuilding and also their dependence on the export. Export value by their GDP is over 40%. So maybe that's of lots of indirect steel export. Maybe those are the elements. I'm just, you know, trying to convince myself this is going to continue. So the business segments, construction downturn after the end of the stimulus, now in adjustment phase, motor vehicle production after the closure of GM uh, plant in South Korea, uh, all, you know, motor vehicle production is 
doesn't look so fabulous. Shipping industry still suffering from global excess fleet capacity. So overall, they are working hard. But one of my friends told me he is so concerned about the future of South Korea. South Korea may become like Japan, very slow and stagnant growth. But the Korean people also, the great people, I think they will overcome the situation in one way or another. The ASEAN, ASEAN undoubtedly growth is very steady. The steel use of ASEAN 5 exceeds that of Japan. And interesting is the ASEAN is the largest importing region. So please look at the lower right uh, chart. So ASEAN's steel use accounts for only 5% of global total. But import, the import accounts for 14% of global. So ASEAN is the largest steel importing region. If you see the chart on the left, ASEAN, I talk about ASEAN, but each country has its own unique situation. Steel use per capita, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, over 200 kgs, while Indonesia still hovering at 50 kg. So share of the construction sector is the largest in all the ASEAN countries. Thailand, because of Thailand is a hub of automotive and home appliance manufacturers, but still construction accounts for almost 60%. So that dependence and the ratio is reflected in the ratios between longs and the flats uh, toward the bottom. And India, no question about India is the fastest GDP growth among the large economies. Still, demand growth is very high and they expect to grow. Uh, still uh, used to grow to 130 million tons by 2020. The government is talking about target of 300 million tons by 2030. That was enormous, the growth. Uh, business sectors, construction investment is backing up very strong infrastructure projects. Automobile out outputs production show steady growth also. Passenger cars, Cars and vehicles for in, uh, construction developments are in the big demand. EU, EU is a country a little far from Japan. We have some interactions, but maybe we have some more experts who could dwell on this issue better than I am. So EU's the growth, the slow in the first half of this year, and the growth is expected at the reduced rate. The car production momentum is expected, but moderately. So steel use gradually increasing. But the, as previous speakers mentioned, there has been some concerns about uh, growing from the Brexit and the fiscal situation in Italy, and also the diminishing role of the Germany, which played important role in the European unity. Those are maybe the concerns. Uh, Brazil, a little bit of Brazil. I touched upon the election, GDP recovering after severe downturn, still use also picking up, but not coming back to the previous levels. Falling price, commodity prices, and also scandal involving uh, their national petroleum uh, company. This cost the life of the former president. I mean to say professional life. And uh, when I met the people from Brazil last month, that was before the election. They are so apprehensive about the election results. So now the new president has been elected. He is known for his populism, but he had assigned pro-business person to the position of finance minister. So they're expecting the new government will fix the homeworks from the previous administrations. Uh, pension reform, and tax reform. Lastly, about the United States, I think people became bored hearing about the economic situations in the United States. 
in association with the results of midterm elections. The United States expects are uh, exceptionally experiencing a robust GDP growth thanks to tax cuts and the government spending. Industrial output is very strong, still use expected to grow moderately. Uh, manufacturing index is almost 60. And the employment rate is 3.7%, which is the lowest since 1969, half century ago. Housing starts. A light vehicle sales are showing the positive signs. But what will be impact of the trade tensions and inflations? They have been talking about, and some economists say, say US tax cuts and government spending in the face of expanding economy is ill-timed. That will lead to higher costs, and also and the higher interest rates and also high US dollars, that means more import and less export, which will lead to deterioration of the trade deficit. So we will see what is going to happen after this. Uh, since I talked about the United States, naturally and logically, I move on to the issue of the trade issues. So U.S. trade policy, so after the World War II, the United States will have played a leading role in crafting multilateral trade system with the cooperation of the member countries. But the United States' is country, which is now heading toward the dismantling order they have crafted and developed. So when President Trump was sworn in, there was some expectation. So things may go back to normal when he's gone. But he has done so much. And the result of an election does not tell which direction going to be. But it seems like we need to embrace the fact. So diminishing role of the United States in the multilateral trade system is going to be there for some time. A USA's US trade agenda, I like to summarize the agenda into three things. Section 232, Section 301, and from NAFTA to USMCA. So uh, Dr. Yayan talked about the US, this invocation of U.S. Trade Expansion Act, Section 232. Before President Trump invoked this the Trade Act, that was, I think that was about the one and a half years ago, I had the conversation with a consultant, U.S. consultant. He's working in Washington, D.C. I asked the question, what do you mean by threat to national security? He said, unfairly subsidized steel coming from China, opposing a threat to steel companies which are supplying steel for defense industry in the United States. I asked him how many percent. He was not quite sure, but that is very insignificant amount. He himself was not convinced. This argument will not hold, not convincing to the people. But as what happened afterwards was after President Trump announced the plans for tariff, U.S. prices jumped 40% higher than those of the peers. So consequently, the U.S. steel producers' performance is getting better. So as you see on the right-hand side, uh, some company was very struggling with the, when the overcapacity issue was pronounced. But finally, it seems like they have finding the room to breathe and about automobiles and automotive parts. The US government is still continuing investigation. No actions has come out of it, but it has far reaching consequences for EU and Japan and maybe some other countries as also. Uh, this is about Japan's exports of the cars and the parts to the USA. 
So if you see, Japan produces about six point, excuse me, nine point six million units, and domestically sold uh, about five point two million units domestically sold. About twenty percent of the cars being produced in Japan are exported to the United States, along with some automotive components. And the Japanese transplants, they built the supply chains in Mexico and Canada. From those operations, they are exporting the cars. So just going back to what I mentioned earlier, 30% of the steel we make in Japan is going to car industries. So if anything happens along this line, that is going to be the big thing. And we need to be carefully watching for what is going to happen after this. And Section 301, uh, actions against unfair trade policy practices, and China intellectual property. So uh, the chart on the left-hand sh side shows a trade deficit with the United States. Red one is China, 50% uh, of the trade deficit with the United States. But if you see the chart on the right-hand side, the China's and the bar is the bilateral trade deficit the United States has with China. And the orange diamond shows the share of U.S. import from the country. That means, say, China's, I mean, China accounts for only 22% in the value of the imports into the United States. But they have 50% trade deficits. So this is a nerving issue for the United States. So the United States starts saying China's a performance or track record of intellectual property right is not so attractive. So, but it is obvious to everyone, United States try to fix the trade deficit with China. And also they like to have regain the leadership and the strategic industries. So talking about China's intellectual property, I heard a very interesting conversation uh, with our people. Later, I will talk about uh, business around the world. We do have some business in China. Well, when we are trying to start the business in China, that was early 2000. So we are talking about the technology transfer agreements. Just, you know, the Chinese people like to have the 50-50 joint venture in the steel sector, and they are requesting very strongly, I don't use the word enforcing, to share a technology know-how, to transfer the know-how to the Chinese the partner. So, heavy discussions, and we are talking about royalties and payment terms and so forth. One of the gentlemen, a Chinese gentleman mentioned, Oh, you're talking about royalty. What will happen to Chinese characters? You Japanese using Chinese characters for 15 centuries. What is going to happen to compensation? But this shows the very unique notion that Chinese people have when it comes to intellectual property. So even the copyright just goes to the 50 years or 70 years, so they are talking about, you know, intellectual property which we owe to them for the past 15 centuries. Maybe I thought he was joking, but uh, I just want to share the colorful example how Chinese people view intellectual property rights. And next one is the retaliatory actions. So the U.S. exports to China, that is a lot less than China's export to the United States. The, both governments re, you know, took the retaliatory actions, but as you see, U.S. has leverage. U.S. Ex imports more from China. So I, I, we need to follow what is going to happen. Uh, lastly, about NAFTA to USMCA. And United States renegotiated NAFTA arrangements with Mexico and Canada. They agreed on the context and the text. And so that will have some changes in terms of country of origin, and that has some uh, impacts on the car productions. 
and Mexico and Canada so forth. So for the company, you know, we produce the steel for the car industry. We are have more than a uh, what shall I say a passing interest in how this new treaty is going to be implemented. So let me summarize, not summarize, let me share my observations about the US trade agenda. Section 232 has something to do with the national security. It seems like President Trump is more concerned about job security in the people in the Rust Belt who voted him into Washington, D.C. Observation number two, American steel producers are talking about level playing field when China had the excess capacity problem. But what we are seeing in the price levels is elevated playing field. Is that what they mean by the fair and level playing field? Observation number three, world economy appear to have been enjoying a very comfortable economic environment, low inflation, and also low interest rates. So that is Goldilocks. But seems like we are heading toward gridlock. The question come to me, did President Trump made a mistake in spelling in his Twitter? I don't know. Lastly, I was debating, say, where I should triumphant or Trump, which one comes first. I followed the advice of President Trump. I was watching, I did not trust the media in the United States. I was watching BBC. So, you know, the Trump said, they said, tweeted message, oh, the result was victorious. But then the minority leader, Mrs. Pelosi said, oh, this is a historic moment. So we are not quite sure which party won which lost. So we are not quite sure the result. President Trump is triumphant. What a Trump. We need to take a look what is going to happen. So having said that, lastly, let me go very briefly about the company. I represent the JFE Steel, JFE Group uh, was built by the merger of NKK and Kawasaki Steel. JFE Holding is a listed company, a listed in Tokyo, and we have four business entities, Steel, Engineering, and JFE Shoji Trading, and also Shipbuilding Company. And we produce about 30 million tons of steel, and over 80% are flat steel. Uh, we have two major steel works, one in the west, uh, produce about 20 million tons, and one in the east, uh, 8 million tons. Uh, we have a tubular plant in between those steelworks. Uh, JFE steel strategies, I'm not just going to read them all. This is too boring. Just want to highlight key words. Manufacturing capabilities, cost, uh, technology, strengthening international businesses. Talking about the international businesses, this chart is lists the companies we closely work with as alliance partners. And we have three strategic fronts, automotive, infrastructure, and energy. So depending on the regions, dynamics of the each economic the regions, our priority differs. Very briefly, China, we have a joint venture with Bao Wu, the largest steel producer in the country, have the cold wall mill, and the galvanizing lines for automotive industries. In Thailand, we have the wholly owned subsidiary, a gal line for automotive applications. In Thailand, Japanese OEM share is over 80%. So we would like to follow our customers in this part of the world. In Indonesia, same story. We had the same gal line. And here in uh, Indonesia, the share of Japanese OEMs also over 80%. Vietnam, we joined Formosa Plastic and the China Steel of Taiwan uh, to invest in the Vietnam's first integrated steelworks. Uh, we have 
two blast furnaces producing about 7 million tons, trying to capture growing demands in that area. We are building construction line in Myanmar, and also we're working closely with the JSW in India. We own the 15%. As I said, India is growing, and we would like to just take advantage of our position in that area. We have a partnership in Pakistan, international steel, and Egypt, candy steel, and we are building a large diameter pipe in uh, Abu Dhabi, Dubai. Lastly, in Mexico, the country I just talked about in, in the context of trade issues and so forth, uh, we are working with Nucor uh, to produce, I mean, uh, gal galvanized steel for automotive industries. So we're trying to grow with the customers in the areas which has great growth potentials. Uh, Chok Tesekiu Eden. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Fujisawa. So, any questions for Mr. Fujisawa? Mr. Fujisawa, thank you very much for this great presentation. It was very interesting for me. Uh, you talked about Brazil in Latin America and the project of moderate growth in the coming years after the elections. But I would like to hear your views about the other countries in South America and Central America. Do you have similar analysis or any idea about the short-term future in these countries, especially considering Chinese prices increasing recently and alternative sources being channeled into this territory? I think many people in this room would be very interested to hear your opinions about that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you about a very good question. I thought the question is going to be in Turkish, so I could say, sorry, I don't understand your question. So I think uh, you, you just, just picked the weak spot uh, for myself. And the Brazil is the, that kind of things. And Argentina is going through the devaluation of the country and so forth. And the Latin American country, generally speaking, the trend has been positive. But the, you know, well, this is so, so far as I, I could just cover Maybe the company you work, Samsung, has a better coverage of have more growth potentials in those regions. Those countries should come back. And also the steel consumption capitals are still not so high and leaving the potentials for them to grow. Thank you for your question. Any other questions? I have a very short question for you, Mr. Kujisawa. Um, Mrs. Bajak has already answered this question, but I also would like to hear your thoughts about this. Who do you think will benefit more from the ongoing trade wars? Is that going to be a test for me? Or <laughs> well, see, the Economic 100 says there's not going to be any winner out of trade wars. And currently, the US steel companies are enjoying very high prices. But that means somebody is a shouldering an extra cost. So generally speaking, I'm say the promoter of the open and the free trade. And what I can say is the more import restrictions will make tradable commodities less affordable. So that hurt especially low income households. So no winner. I don't think as the results of midterm elections. It was very interesting. No winner and no losers. Democrats, Mr. Trump, we are not quite sure who lost and who is winner. So this, maybe I'm, my analogy may be too stretched, but um, I hope I can answer your question in a unique way. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. Any other questions? Thank you very much for the nice presentation. And my uh, question is very short. Uh, do you believe that Mr. Trump will change his way while he is in power? I have to confess, I'm not the political scientist by profession either. <laughs> 
Uh, one thing I could say is I was watching the news two days ago. That was the strategist. She was a strategist for the Republican parties. Mr. Trump has a very acute political instinct. So people say he's a man of idiosyncrasies, but he acutely aware what people can expect out of him. So if he, if he start feeling some people are suffering due to the high steel prices and lower margins on the car industries, I think he will moderate his direction to some extent. But he want to be eye catchy, so he need have some kind of excuse to change the direction. So this is my the personal assessment. As we are running out of time, I won't be able to take another question. So thank you very much, thank Mr. Fujisawa.